We're going to do what's called the Great Debate, Does God Exist? Uh, Greg Bonson is going to be presenting the uh, Christian uh, perspective, and he's going to be doing it from a presuppositional approach, which is, again, as I said, is quite different than, you, than the normal approach, which is more evidentialist, and he's going to go against uh, uh, Dr. Gordon Stein. So there'll, there'll be introductions in this. So I'm going to go ahead and play this, and then uh, pay attention because we'll discuss it. Hey, does God exist? My name is Ben Holm, and I direct the program of speech and debate here at the University of California, Irvine. I want to welcome you here this evening on behalf of the speech and debate team. Like many of you, I don't How's think that Time that okay Magazine fully really exhausted everybody? this question a couple of years ago in its cover oh, it's article. Okay. Okay. And so we're here to ask the question again. And to begin, I'd not like to be inappropriate and offer an invocation, but instead, I'd like to point to you the sponsor of tonight's debate, and that is the UCI speech and debate team, nationally ranked 21st in the country. And I'd also like to introduce to you a member of that speech and debate team, himself a nationally ranked speaker and the team's president, and our moderator this evening, David Agopian. Thank you. I too would like to welcome each and every one of you to this evening's debate. I hope you excuse my somewhat congested tone, but these kinds of viruses usually occur when you spend hundreds of hours and many late nights planning great debates. So uh, if I happen to sneeze during tonight, I would ask you that in light of tonight's topic, you'd think twice about saying God bless you. Um, <laughs> Seriously, though, I would ask for your cooperation tonight in making my job much easier by demonstrating the utmost courtesy and respect for both speakers. We have two highly able scholars with us this evening to debate the issues better than any of us ever might imagine to do. I would ask, therefore, that you would refrain from any applause during the course of the debate. The basic reason for that being tonight's debate is strictly time. Once the time segment begins, the time clock continues to run until it has expired. In other words, when you applaud, you're only taking away the time your speaker has to communicate his particular viewpoint here this evening. I would also ask, in addition to refraining from applause, that you would also refrain, and refrain that is, from flash bulbs, if you have any flash cameras with you here this evening. And the final note of my stern disciplinarian attitude this evening, I would ask that you would also refrain from any external verbal participation here this evening. That's a speech and debate way of saying we'd ask you if you'd please allow the scholars to do the debating. We do have CSO officers here and former university football players who will... Uh, <laughs> They'd be happy to exert their influence, shall we say, and escort you to the door. But we would seriously ask for your cooperation in that. Allow me now to explain the logistics of the mechanics that we're going to follow in this evening's debate. The debate format, very briefly, it's a hybrid debate format. It's not as strenuous or rigid as the presidential debate, as you saw earlier this year. And it's not as strenuous as the intercollegiate debate patterns. This evening's debate, if you'd open up your program and look on the left-hand page, you'll find the exact format that we will be employing here tonight. This evening's debate is divided up into four major segments. Segments numbered one through three will comprise the main debate. Segment number four will be a question and answer period. Segment number one will begin with two 15-minute opening statements presented by each speaker. After those opening statements are presented, we will also have a period of cross-examination. Now in debate theory, cross-examination is basically an opportunity for each opponent to interrogate or pose questions or cross-examine his opponent for logical fallacies, etc. It can also be used as a means of pointing out points of clarification. After cross-examination is completed, we will then have two eight-minute rebuttals, and that will conclude segment number one. We'll then begin segment number two, which is exactly the same format as segment number one, with two exceptions. The speaking order, as you notice, will be inverted, and shorter time increments will be employed. And that will take us all the way up to segment number three, which will simply be two 10-minute closing statements. After segment number three is concluded, this is my most important announcement, we will be handling questions and answers. As you can see, there are no floor microphones, and it's a pretty good thing given the difficulty in access to the floors here this evening. So what we have planned to do is to handle questions and answers vis-a-vis -vis written format. Each of you has had, inc had included in your evening program a blank sheet of paper. 
we would ask that if a question comes to your mind during the course of the debate, that that question would be recorded on that piece of paper if you so desire to possibly have that question answered. At the conclusion of segment number three, our speech and debate team ushers will quickly, promptly enter the aisles to collect those questions from you fighting over the people seated in the aisles, and they will then be delivered over to our question panelists. They will be sorted through rather quickly, and then we will have three questions for either speaker, depending on the time that we have left with us here this evening. Having explained the logistics of the debate, I'd like to introduce to you this evening's speakers. Please give a warm welcome to Dr. Gordon Stein and Dr. Greg Bonson. I'd like to introduce each speaker to you now, let you know a little bit more about their biographical background. Dr. Greg Bonson holds the Master of Divinity and the Master of Theology from Westminster Theological Seminary, as well as a PhD in Philosophy from the University of Southern California. He has fulfilled professorships at Reformed Theological Seminary in Jackson, Mississippi, and at Ashland Theological Seminary in Ohio. He is a member of the Evangelical Theological Society, the Society of Christian Philosophers, the American Philosophical Society, as well as an advisory board member of the International Council on Biblical Inerrancy. Dr. Bonson has published numerous articles on apologetics, ethics, and Christian theology, as well as four scholarly books. Dr. Bonson is currently the pastor of Covenant Community Church, located in Placentia, California, and resides in the Orange County area with his wife, Kathy, and his four children. Debating Dr. Bonson this evening will be Dr. Gordon Stein. Dr. Gordon Stein received a PhD from Ohio State University. He has established himself as one of America's foremost scholars of atheism. He is currently the president of the American Rationalist Federation, president of the Free Thought Association, member of the board of directors of the North American Committee for Humanism, vice president Pacific of the Freedom from Religion Foundation, and vice president of Atheists United. Dr. Stein has authored five leading books, two pamphlets, one of which, by the way, is entitled How to Argue with a Theist and Win, as well as several scholarly articles. He is also the editor of the American Rationalist Journal and the associate editor of Free Inquiry Magazine. Having introduced both speakers to you, we will now begin this evening's debate. The resolution before us is in the form of an interrogative, a question. Does God exist? Dr. Bonson, I'll now ask for your 15-minute opening statement, please. Thank you, David. I want to begin this evening with three opening and introductory remarks about the nature of the debate itself. First of all, it's necessary at the outset of our debate to define our terms, that's always the case, and in particular here, I should make it clear what I mean when I use the term God. I want to specify that I'm arguing particularly in favor of Christian theism and for it as a unit or system of thought and not for anything like theism in general and there are reasons for that three uh, the various conceptions of deity found in the world religions are in most cases logically incompatible leaving no unambiguous sense to general theism whatever that might be secondly i have not found the non-christian religions to be philosophically defensible each of them being internally incoherent or undermining human and reason and experience. And thirdly, since I am, by the grace of God, a Christian, I cannot from the heart adequately defend those religious faiths with, with which I disagree. My commitment is to the triune God and Christian worldview based on God's revelation in the Old and New Testaments. So first, then, I'm defending Christian theism. Secondly, I want to observe, and we should indicate just what it is and is not at issue in the debate and on the basis of which we hope you'll consider the debate. It must be made clear that we are debating about philosophical systems, not the people who adhere to or profess them. Our concern is with the objective merits of the case which can be made for atheism or Christian theism, not related subjective or personal matters. And again, I have three reasons for illustrations of this. The personalities of those individuals who adhere to different systems of thought are not really relevant to the truth or falsity of the claims made by those systems. Atheists and Christians can equally be found emotional, unlearned, intolerant, or rude in their approaches. 
Uh, secondly, subjective claims made about the experience of inner satisfaction or peace, claims that are made, interestingly, by both Christians and atheists in their literature, and promotional claims made about the superiority of Christianity or atheism. For instance, some atheist literature suggests that greater mental health comes through the independence of the atheist outlook. These sorts of things are always subject to conflicting interpretations and explanations, being, I think, more autobiographical rather than telling us anything for sure about the truth of the system under consideration. Uh, thirdly, the issue is not whether atheists or professing Christians have ever done anything undesirable or morally unacceptable. One need only think respectively of the atheist involvement in the reign of terror in the French Revolution and the professing Christian involvement in the Spanish Inquisition. Now, the question is not whether adherents of these systems have uh, lived spotless lives, but whether atheism or Christian theism as philosophical systems are objectively true. And so I'll be defending Christian theism, and I'll be defending it as a philosophical system. And my last introductory remark is simply to the effect that I want to concede to my opponent all issues pertaining to the control of ovarian maturation in Japanese quail. Okay, the subject of his doctoral dissertation in 1974 at Ohio State. Dr. Stein is a man of intelligence, and that's not in question in this debate. I would not pretend to hold my own in a discussion with him of the empirical details of his narrow domain of specialized natural science. However, our subject tonight is really much different, calling for intelligent reflection upon issues which are philosophical or theological in character. For some reason, Dr. Stein has, over the last decade, left his field of expertise and given his life to a campaign for atheism. Whatever his perception of the reason for that, I do not believe that it is because of any genuinely cogent philosophical case which might be made for atheism as a worldview. And it's to this subject which I now turn for tonight's debate. My opening case for the existence of God will cover three areas of thought. They are the nature of evidence, the presuppositional conflict of worldviews, and finally, the transcendental argument for God's existence. First of all, the nature of evidence. How should the difference of opinion between the theist and the atheist be rationally resolved? What Dr. Stein has written indicates that he, like many atheists, has not reflected adequately on this question. He writes, and I quote, the question of the existence of God is a factual question and should be answered in the same way as any other factual question." End of quote. The assumption that all existence claims are questions about matters of fact, the assumption that these are all answered in the very same way is not merely oversimplified and misleading, it is simply mistaken. The existence, factuality, or reality of different kinds of things is not established or disconfirmed in the same way in every case. We might ask, is there a box of crackers in the pantry? And we know how we would go about answering that question. But that is a far, far cry from the way we go about answering a question and determining the reality of, say, barometric pressure, quasars, gravitational attraction, elasticity, radioactivity, natural laws, names, grammar, numbers, the university itself that you're now at, past events, categories, future contingencies, laws of thought, political obligations, individual identity over time, causation, memories, dreams, or even love or beauty. In such cases, one does not do anything like walking to the pantry and looking inside for the crackers. There are thousands of existence or factual questions, and they are not at all answered in the same way in each case. Just think of the differences in argumentation and types of evidence used by biologists, grammarians, physicists, mathematicians, lawyers, logicians, mechanics, merchants, and artists. It should be obvious that the type of evidence which one looks for in existence or factual claims will be determined by the field of discussion and especially by the metaphysical nature of the entity mentioned in the claim under question. Dr. Stein's remark that the existence of uh, God 
is answered, the question of the existence of God is answered in the same way as any other factual question, mistakenly reduces the theistic question to the same level as a box of crackers in the pantry, which we will hereafter call the crackers in the pantry fallacy. <laughs> Secondly, then I'd like to talk about the presuppositional conflict of worldviews. Dr. Stein has written about the nature of evidence in the theistic debate, and what he has said points to a second philosophical error of significant proportions. In passing, we would note how unclear he is, by the way, in speaking of the evidence which must be used, describing it variously as logic, facts, or reason. Each of these terms is susceptible to a whole host of differing senses, not only in philosophy, but especially in ordinary usage, depending on who's using the terms. I take it he wishes to judge hypotheses in the common sense by test of logical coherence and empirical observation. The problem arises when Dr. Stein elsewhere insists that every claim which someone makes must be treated as a hypothesis which must be tested by such evidence before accepting it. There is to be nothing, he says, which smacks of begging the question or circular reasoning. This, I think, is oversimplified thinking, and again misleading, what we might call the pretended neutrality fallacy. One can see this by considering the following quotation from Dr. Stein, and I quote, The use of logic or reason is the only valid way to examine the truth or falsity of a statement which claims to be factual. That's the end of the quote. One must eventually ask Dr. Stein, then, how he proves this statement itself. That is, how does he prove that logic or reason is the only way to prove factual statements? He's now on the horns of a real epistemological dilemma. If he says that the statement is proven by logic or reason, then he's engaging in circular reasoning and he's begging the question, which he staunchly forbids. If he says that the statement is proven in some other fashion, then he refutes the statement itself, that logic or reason is the only way to prove things. Now my point is not to def not to fault Dr. Stein's commitment to logic or reason, but to observe that it actually has the nature of a pre-commitment or a presupposition. It is not something he has proven by empirical experience or logic, but it is rather that by which he proceeds to prove everything else. He is not presuppositionally neutral in his approach to factual questions and disputes. He does not avoid begging crucial questions rather than proving them in what we might call the garden variety, ordinary way. Now this tendency to beg crucial questions is openly exposed by Dr. Stein when the issue becomes the existence of God, because he demands that the theists present him with evidence for the existence of God. Now theists like myself would gladly and readily do so. There is the evidence of the created order itself, testifying to the wisdom, power, plan, and glory of God. One should not miss the testimony of the solar system, the persuasion of the sea, the amazing intricacies of the human body. There's the evidence of history, God's deliverance of his people, the miracles at Passover night in the Red Sea, the visions of Isaiah, the Shekinah glory in the temple, the virgin birth of Jesus, his mighty miracles, his resurrection from the dead. There's the evidence of special revelation, the wonder of the Bible as God's word, unsurpassed in its coherence over time and its historical accuracy and its life-renewing power. In short, there is no shortage of empirical indicators or evidences of God's existence, from the thousand stars of the heavens to the 500 witnesses of Christ's resurrection. But Dr. Stein precludes the very possibility of any of this empirical evidence counting as proof of God's existence. He writes, and now I quote, Supernatural explanations are not allowed in science. The theist is hard put to document his claims to the existence of the supernatural if he is, in effect, forbidden from invoking the supernatural as a part of his explanation. Of course, this is entirely fair as it would be begging the question to use what has to be proved as a part of the explanation. End of quote. In advance, you see, Dr. Stein is committed to disallowing any theistic interpretation of nature, history, or experience. What he seems to overlook is that this is just as much begging the question on his own part as it is on the part of the theist who appeal to such evidence. He is not at all proven by empirical observation and logic his pre-commitment to naturalism. He has assumed it in advance, accepting and rejecting all 
further factual claims in terms of that controlling and unproven assumption. Now, the theist does the very same thing, don't get me wrong. When certain empirical evidences are put forth as allegedly disproving the existence of God, the theist regiments his commitments in terms of his presuppositions as well. See, just as the naturalist would insist that Christ could not have risen from the dead or that there is a natural explanation yet to be found of how he did rise from the dead, so the supernaturalist insists that the alleged discrepancies in the Bible have an explanation, some yet to be found perhaps, and that the evil of this world has a sufficient reason behind it, known at least to God. They both have their governing presuppositions by which the facts of experience are interpreted, even as all philosophical systems, all worldviews do. At the most fundamental level of everyone's thinking and beliefs, there are primary convictions about reality, man, the world, knowledge, truth, behavior, and such things. Convictions about which all other experience is organized, interpreted, and applied. Dr. Stein has such presuppositions, and so do I, and so do all of you. And it is these presuppositions which determine what we accept by ordinary reasoning and evidence, for they are assumed in all of our reasoning, even about reasoning itself. And so I come thirdly then to the transcendental proof of God's existence. How then should the difference of opinion between the theist and the atheist be rationally resolved? That was my opening question. We've seen two of Dr. Stein's errors regarding it. The crackers in the pantry fallacy and the pretended neutrality fallacy. In the process of discussing them, we have observed that belief in the existence of God is not tested in any ordinary way like other factual claims. And the reason for that is metaphysically because of the non-natural character of God and epistemologically because of the presuppositional character of commitment for or against his existence. Arguments over conflicting presuppositions between worldviews therefore must be resolved somewhat differently and yet still rationally than conflicts over factual existence claims within a worldview or system of thoughts. When we go to look at the different worldviews that atheists and theists have, I suggest that we can prove the existence of God from the impossibility of the contrary. The transcendental proof for God's existence is that without him, it is impossible to prove anything. The atheist worldview is irrational and cannot consistently provide the preconditions of intelligible experience science, logic, or morality. The atheist worldview cannot allow for laws of logic, the uniformity of nature, the ability for the mind to understand the world, and moral absolutes. And in that sense, the atheist worldview cannot account for our debate tonight. Thank you, Dr. Bonson, for your opening statement. We now turn to you, Dr. Stein. Your 15-minute opening statement, please. Can everybody hear me? I assume so. Well, I will, I will grant uh, Dr. Bonson his expertise uh, on a conditional resolution of the apparent paradox of self-deception, which was his dissertation. I don't know how much more relevant that is to our discussion tonight than mine is, probably not anymore. But uh, I would like to also thank Dr. Bonson for uh, showing us that he really doesn't understand too much about atheism. I will try to straighten him out. This is an important question we're discussing. Perhaps it's the most important question in the whole field of religion. Because if God does not exist, then the Bible can't be the word of God, Jesus can't be the Messiah, and Christianity cannot be true as, long, or as well as other religions. So we, we're dealing with an important issue here. Now, Dr. Bonson repeated for me that the existence of God is a factual question. I, I don't think he would dispute that. I think he misinterpreted what I said when I said that that we solve factual questions in the same way. I didn't mean exactly the same way, I mean but the use of reason, logic, and evidence. And that is what I'm holding. Now, first let me, let me uh, make clear what atheism is and is not. I think this is a very commonly misunderstood subject. Atheists do not say that there 
that they can prove that there's no God. They also, is, an atheist is not someone who denies that there is a God. Rather, an atheist says that he has examined the proofs that are offered by the theist and he finds them inadequate. Now, if I were to say that this gentleman in the, sitting on the front step could fly by flapping his arms, I would be making a kind of unusual statement and I, it would be up to me or him to demonstrate that he could fly. If he can't demonstrate it, then we don't believe that he can fly. Now, if, if he doesn't demonstrate it right now, that doesn't mean he can't fly, it just means he can't fly right now. Now, so that we do not deny that he can fly because he can't demonstrate it right now, but we say he has not proven his case. And therefore, we do not believe that he can fly until he does so, prove so. And this is what an atheist says about the existence of God. He says the case is unproven, not disproven. So an atheist is really someone who is without a belief in God or who does not believe in a God. It is not someone who denies the existence of a God or who uh, says that one does not exist or can prove that one does not exist. Now, I think uh, I would like to define a God as well. I'm not so sure I like his definition. I'm not going to stick to just Christian God. I'm going to stick to all kinds of God. And I'm going to use the definition which both Father Copleston and Bertrand Russell both agreed on in their famous debate. Now, this was both sides, the leading exponents of both sides, both managed to agree on the definition of God, so I think it must be at least an adequate one, if not a great one. And this is the definition. A supreme personal being, distinct from the world and creator of the world. Now, before asking for proof of God's existence, we need, a, we need this satisfactory definition. And uh, I, I think I've given one which I will find at least satisfactory, and if Dr. Bonson doesn't agree, we can hear from him. Now, nothing can qualify as evidence for the existence of a God unless we have some idea what we're searching for. That's why we need the definition. Okay, now, throughout history, 11 major kinds of evidence or proof have been offered in my, for the existence of God. In my campus visits, I have heard all kinds of other things offered as proof, but they basically fall into those 11 categories with some juggling. And if these 11 proofs do not work out logically or lead to logical self-contradictions, then we can only say that God's existence is not proved, it's unproven, not disproven, as I mentioned before. Now, if if I um, assert that this gentleman can fly by flapping his arms, as I said, the burden of proof was on him. Supposing I make a more complicated statement. Supposing I say that my dog can talk in complete sentences. Okay, well, again, I'm making a kind of unusual statement, and it's up to me to offer the evidence. So I'd better be prepared to do that, or I'd better be prepared to have people not believe what I say. And I'd like a demonstration, either of this gentleman's flying or of my dog talking, if I were the person who was being asked to make a conclusion, before I admitted that such things were possible or existed. Okay, now how easy would it be to show that this gentleman cannot fly or that my dog cannot talk in complete sentences? As I mentioned before, uh, we get into a real problem when we're trying to show that something cannot happen or that something does not exist. For example, if, if I wanted to prove that unicorns do not exist, I can examine this room and we can find out that there are definitely no unicorns in this room. That's a small area. But to prove the general non-existence of something like unicorns, we would have to search the entire universe simultaneously, and then we could only say that no unicorns existed at the moment we searched the universe. But, you know, maybe they were there five minutes before, or if we only searched the whole Earth, maybe they were on another planet at the time. I mean, there are all kinds of other possibilities. So you cannot prove that something does not exist. And that's why, as I mentioned before, the definition of an atheist is not someone who thinks he has proven that God does not exist because you cannot. Okay, now of those 11 major proofs, um, I'm going to go over some of them very quickly. They've been... One, 900 years in the formulation, and during this 900 years, this is basically what people have come up with. The first cause argument, also called the cosmological argument, it says that everything must have a cause. Therefore, the universe had a cause, and that cause was God. God was the first or uncaused cause. 
Okay, well, this, is, this leads into a real logical bind for the theist, because if everything must have had a cause, then God must have had a cause. If God had a cause, then he was not the first or uncaused cause. If God did not have a cause, then not everything must have a cause. If not everything needs a cause, then perhaps the universe is one of those things which doesn't need a cause. So you see that we've gotten into a logical bind there, and that proof basically fails. Now, I'm giving you a real short synopsis of each of these proofs. They could fill an entire book and have. So you have to understand I'm oversimplifying slightly, but I think I'm retaining the logic of it, both the pro and con. The second one is the design argument, also called the teleological argument. It says that the universe is wonderful and exhibits evidence of design or order. Things which show such wonderful design must have had a designer who was even more wonderful, and that designer was God. Well, if the universe is wonderfully designed, surely God is even more wonderfully designed. He must therefore have had a designer even more wonderful than he is. If God did not require a designer, then there's no reason why such a relatively less wonderful thing than the as the universe needed one. Again, we're into a logical self-contradiction. The argument from life says life cannot originate from the random movement of atoms, yet life exists. Therefore, the existence of a god was necessary to create life. Well, basically, life didn't originate from the random movements of atoms, and no scientist would say so, because there are limits on the chemical composition and physics of atoms, and they don't move in any possible way, and chemicals do not combine in any possible way. That's why when you see these one billion to one kind of odds that people have said for life originating, they're all wet. They haven't considered the possibility that not every reaction can occur. So uh, it's possible to explain the origin of life without a god, and using the principle of parsimony or Occam's razor, I think we are left with the uh, simpler explanation as the one without the god. I'll go into more detail on that later. Then we have the argument from re revealed theology, which seems to be one of Dr. Bronson's favorites. Uh, it says that the Bible says that God exists, and the Bible is the inspired word of God. Therefore, what it says must be true. Therefore, God exists. Well, this is obviously a circular argument. Uh, it begs the question. We're trying to show whether God exists. Therefore, calling the Bible the word of God is not permitted, because it assumes the existence of the very thing we're trying to prove. Now, if the Bible is not the word of God in this case, then we cannot give any real weight to the fact that it mentions that God exists. It does not become a proof. In fact, to prove God from the Bible is standing things on its head. First, you must prove God. Then you may say, examine whether God wrote the Bible or dictated it or inspired it. But you can't really use the Bible, as Dr. Bonson seems to want to do, as evidence for the existence of God, per se. Then we have the argument for miracles. It says that the existence of miracles requires the presence of a supernatural force, that is, a god. Miracles do occur, therefore there is a supernatural force or god. Again, this is begging the question. It requires that you must believe in the existence of a god first, beforehand, and then you say that there are such things as miracles, which are the acting of a god to create violations of his own laws. So it is not evidence per se. It can serve as supplementary once you've had good evidence in another kind of a way for the existence of a God. Then you can use miracles as an additional argument. But in and of itself, it doesn't show the existence of a God because it assumes that which is to be proven. I just want to quote you one little thing from Thomas Paine about miracles. If we see an account given of such a miracle by a person who said he saw it, it raises a question in the mind of the very, that is very easily decided, which is, is it more probable that nature should go out of her course or that a man should tell a lie? We have never seen in our time nature go out of her course, but we have good reason to believe that millions of lies have been told in the same time. It is therefore at least millions to one that the reporter of a miracle tells a lie. I think those are good odds. Then we come to the ontological argument, one of the most difficult ones to explain to people. But basically it says, God is by definition perfect. A necessary quality of any perfect object is that it exists. If it did not exist, it would not be perfect. If perfection requires existence, then God exists, since God is perfect. Now, I don't know if you follow that, but I think this has been pretty well uh, ripped to shreds by philosophers, and I think the problem lies with the, with the trouble. The trouble is with the word exist. In order for something to be perfect, it must first exist. 
I mean, if, if something did not exist, you wouldn't, the word perfect wouldn't mean anything. So first you must have existence, then possibly you may have perfection. So this, again, is going backwards, and you must have an existing God, then you can decide whether he's perfect. If perfectness is a quality of, of, of a God, then he may be perfect. But he first must exist. Then we have the moral argument. All people have moral values. The existence of these values cannot be explained unless they were implanted in people by a God. Therefore, God exists. Well, the answer to this is that there are simpler ways of explaining the origin of moral values without requiring the existence of a God to implant them in people. Besides, if moral values did come from a God, then all people should have the same moral values, and they don't. People's moral values are the result of an accommodation which they have made with their particular environment and then taught to their children. It's a survival mechanism. Okay, then we have the wish argument. Without the existence of a God, people would have no reason to live or be good. Therefore, there has to be a God. Most people believe in a God, therefore there is a God. This really isn't a proof, it's just a wish. It's like saying it would be nice to have a God, which it would, but, you know, that doesn't have anything to do with whether there is one or not. Um, finally, we have... Oh, I'm missing one here. Then we have the argument from faith. The existence of a God cannot be proven by the use of reason, but only by the use of faith. The use of faith shows that there is a God, therefore God exists. Reason or logic is a proven way of obtaining factual information about the universe. Faith has never been shown to produce true information about the universe because, because faith is believing something is so because you want it to be so without adequate evidence. Therefore, it can't be used to prove the existence of anything. In addition, the additional fact is that faith often gives you the opposite answer to what is given by reason to the same problem. And this also shows that faith does not provide valid answers. Uh, the argument from religious experience, many people have claimed to have had a personal experience or encounter with God, therefore he must exist. Now this is a difficult one to handle because, first of all, I've never had such an experience, but I'm sure people have absolutely, honestly reported having had such experiences. But the feeling of having met God must not be confused with the fact of having met him. This is a a confusion, a semantic confusion, and, and also uh, we cannot use our own feelings as, as if they were valid information about the world. They are feelings that we have inside of us, but you cannot demonstrate them to another person. They cannot be used as an evidence. If everyone had that same experience, like if we all looked around the room and we all agreed that there was a clock over there, then we, we might say that the vision of a clock was a consensual one that everyone agreed on it. Other than that, if you saw a clock and nobody else did, or only two or three people did in the room, we would have a bit of a problem. Pascal's wager is the last of the 11 arguments. I hear this a lot on the campuses. It says, since we don't know whether a God exists or not, we have no way of finding out in this life. We have nothing to lose by believing in a God. On the other hand, we have a lot to lose if we do not believe in a God, and therefore later, that later turns out to be one after we're dead. Well, this is only true if number one, you're right about a God, and secondly, if you have picked the right religion, because you might wind up at the judgment day and be right about a God, but he says, what religion were you? And you say, I was an Islam, believer in Islam, and he said, sorry, Catholicism is the right religion, down you go. <laughs> so, in addition, we might also have, if we have a God who punishes people who live virtuous lives, let's say an atheist who lived virtuous life, did wonderful deeds in the world, but just did not believe in a God, if the God punishes him, then we have an irrational God who's just as likely to punish the believer as the unbeliever. Thank you, Dr. Stein. We will now move to our period of cross-examination. The first cross-examiner will be Dr. Bonson. We'll have an opportunity to cross-examine Dr. Stein. If I could please have silence, we would appreciate it. Dr. Stein, do you have any sources uh, that you can give to us very briefly that uh, define atheism as one who uh, finds the theistic proofs inadequate rather than one who denies the existence of God. Yes, sir. George Smith's book, which you will find for sale in the back of the room upstairs later, called Atheism, the Case Against God, make, which I think is the finest book ever written on the subject, makes this quite explicit. I happen to have a copy right here. I can quote you the exact words if you'd like no, to see them. that won't be necessary. Okay. Do you have any other sources? Do I have any other sources? Do you have any other sources? Sure. Uh, what would they be? Charles Bradlaugh, who uh, 
I will give them to you right now. Hey, 200, uh, 100 years ago, Charles Bradlaugh made the, the comment in one of in his uh, a plea for atheism. He said, "That'll be fine." Okay. Well, Dr. Stein, did you hear Dr. Bonson use the following argument? The Bible says that God exists, and the Bible is the inspired word of God. Therefore, what it says must be true. Therefore, God exists. You did not use that and just assume that that was so because you were quoting from the Bible as if it proved the existence of God. I didn't ask you what I assumed. I asked you if I used that argument. No, you did not use the argument, but you used the results of the argument. Hey, Dr. Stein, you mentioned 11 basic proofs for the existence of God. Did you mention the transcendental proof for the existence of God? No, I didn't mention it by name. I think it is not a proof. I would not call it a proof, if, as I understand it from what you said. On that point. In other okay. words, you didn't deal with that particular one. Are all factual questions answered in the very same way? No, they are not. They're answered by the use of certain methods, though, that are the same. Reason, logic, and presenting evidence. Right. I heard you mention logical binds and logical self-contradictions in your speech. Mm -hmm. You did say that? I said it. I used that phrase, yes. Do you believe there are laws of logic, then? Absolutely. Are they universal? They're agreed upon by human beings. They aren't laws that exist out in nature. They are. Are they simply conventions then? They are conventions, but they are conventions that are self-verifying. Are they sociological laws or laws of thought? They are laws of thought which are interpreted by men and promulgated by men. Are they material in nature? How can a law be material? That's the question I'm going to ask you. I would say no. In fact, sign that you have an opportunity to cross examine Dr. Bonson. Dr. Bonson, uh, would you call God material or immaterial? Immaterial. What is something that's immaterial? Something not extended in space. Can you give me an example of anything other than God that's immaterial? Laws of logic. Can I ask that you hold that down, please? Are you putting God in the same, in the, as an equivalent thing to the laws of logic? No, only if you think all factual questions are answered in the very same way would you even assume that by thinking there are two immaterial things, they must be identical. No, no I'm, I'm not assuming that. I'm just assuming that because the laws of logic are a convention among men, are you saying that God is a convention among men? I don't accept the fact that, laws okay. that claim the laws of logic are conventional. Okay. Uh, is your God omnipotent, omniscient, and omnibenevolent? He is. You don't find this a contradiction at all? I do not. Okay, well, we'll show you a little later that it is. Um, if your arguments in favor of the existence of God are shown to be incorrect, will you relinquish your be belief in God? If my arguments are disproven, yes. will I relinquish my belief in God? If there are no arguments for the existence of God, I wouldn't believe in God. That's not quite answering the question. If someone can show you that there are no arguments, would you relinquish your belief? I'm no, trying to see what, what's the no, basis you're the for your belief. the one who said that it's impossible to show a universal negative. No one can show that there are no arguments for the existence of God, so we can only deal with those that I know of. Okay, if someone showed that all of the ones that you produced were invalid, what would be your position? Well, you'd have to describe proof of the conditions of this. Uh, rationally speaking, if there is no basis for belief in the existence of God, I would relinquish that belief. Okay. Is God good? Yes, he is. How do you know that? He saved me. He created me. He made the world and he made it good. He sent his son into the world to die for my sins. Many of these evidences are quite convincing to me, but I don't use them outside of the worldview in which they make sense, in which they would be taken as true. If you mean, is God good in such a way, or can I give you evidence that you would accept, that would depend on what your presuppositions are. No, I'm asking, if God says something, anything, is it right because what God, anything God does is good, because God is good, or does it become good just because God said it? I don't know if I said that right. I guess I did. No, I understand the problem, though, it's roughly stated. 
what God says to be good is good because it reflects his own character. God is good and is the standard of goodness. That's one of the presuppositions of the Christian worldview. Doesn't it indeed, isn't it indeed a presupposition which is presupposed before there is even any actual data from God? Is this a question about my first opening statement? In a sense it is, because although it isn't directly mentioned in your opening statement, it, it, it has to do with the whole idea of whether there are absolutes outside of God, which is a important issue in this whole debate. It may come up later. I still think we're straining at the limits of uh, debate rules here, but I will answer your question. There are no absolutes outside of God. So in other words, the fact that God is good is something that God told you, and that's why you accept it, rather than knowing it ahead and assuming it as a presupposition, which you said a minute ago. No, that's extremely simplistic. God told it to me, and he provided evidence of it. But you also said it was a presupposition. That's right. Isn't, well, that, a, isn't that a contradiction? Oh, not at all. There are many things which are presupposed as well as uh, uh, evidenced in this world. For instance, the laws of logic. I would disagree with that, but... Um, well, I still have some time. All right. When we talk about immaterial things, are you also saying that there's a, such a thing as, uh, let's say, ghosts or the soul, which are another example of immaterial things? Would you call them immaterial? I would, trying... say, I would say that man is a living soul and has an immaterial aspect to his being, yes. Mm -hmm. And how would you approve this? this have to do with the existence of God now? Well, it has to do with the existence of immaterial things. Well, if there's an immaterial being, God, and if the Bible is his word, then I would say that uh, his revealing the nature of man in the Bible is sufficient proof. And that takes us back logically, as you'll be bound to say, to whether God himself does exist. And that's what we're supposed to be debating. Okay, so you're giving me a circular argument, which uh, is... No, I'm telling you what the debate is about. Basically. Well, I know what the debate is about. Yeah. I, I'm asking for an answer to a question, and I didn't get one. Oh, yeah, I'm not debating the nature of the soul tonight, but the existence of God. Yes, I believe in the man has a soul. Okay, the only reason I asked about the soul is because this is a simpler immaterial object that most people would hold is also immaterial. Well, I don't say that it's similar. I mean, that's your claim. Oh, simpler, I said, not similar. Okay. Okay. Okay, let's make a few uh, points of analysis on the first part of the debate. Okay, so you had introductory uh, remarks from Bonson and Stein and then a little bit of cross-examination. Uh, I think the methodology here of the two ends up being something uh, important. Uh, notice uh, right away, again, this is if you have a copy in front of you, but uh, in his opening statement, if you notice, Bonson was very upfront about arguing for Christian theism and not any other form of theism. So that's different than usually what you see with the classical or evidentialist approach. He just comes straight out. He states uh, non-Christian religions to be philosophically, I found, I have not found the non-Christian re religions to be philosophically defensible. They're internally incoherent and undermine human reason and experience. So he defends Christian theism. Uh, you know, one of the things that he goes into is he kind of uh, deals with what he knows will be a futuristic uh, objection made from atheists, which is oftentimes people will say, well, Christianity is true. Why were there the Crusades? Why are there all these awful atrocities in the name of Christianity? He blunts that argument by stating, look, there's... Yeah, it's not based on the personalities of the people. The system itself does not necessarily rely on how certain individuals may abuse the system. And then he points out you have atrocities from atheists as well. So he, he I, I think what he's doing there is he's, he's anticipating an objection and dealing with it before it even comes up. And then, of course, he does the thing that you're supposed to do when you're uh, debating somebody is uh, one of the ways they say in which you can get into somebody, your opponent's head is to indicate to them that you're aware of their dissertation. <laughs> so I remember Paige Patterson telling us that in my PhD seminar. But if you want to, you know, kind of get an advantage or whatever, tell the guy that you've read his dissertation. Of course, hopefully that'd be true. And then uh, they figure if you've gone to that depth, you must really know your stuff. So 
And so he, he, he granted to him the whole issue of the control of ovarian maturation in Japanese whales. <laughs> I, it, you know, it was, to me, it was just, when, when, he, when Stein tried to do the same thing with Bonsons, I, I will grant his expertise on a conditional resolution of the apparent paradox of self-deception. And he says, I don't know how much more relevant that is to our discussion. That's very relevant. <laughs> <laughs> That's very relevant. I thought that was ironic there. Uh, so then he gets into the opening uh, case for the existence of God. This is page two in the PDF form. So he... Uh, you know, he talks about that you don't prove everything the same way. And then he gets into the, uh, on page three, the presuppositional conflict of worldviews. You know, he deals with the crackers in the pantry fallacy and the pre pretended neutrality fallacy. I think what he does there, like I said, if you're not used to this kind of approach, it might miss you. But he's, what he does here in this section is he goes after the whole issue of pre-commitments and presuppositions and arguing that, nobody's totally neutral. This guy is going to try to tell you that he's being neutral, but he's not neutral. So I thought that that was, uh, that was pretty effective because what he's pointing out is this guy is admitting that he's going to start with, uh, with reason and he's going to assume that. So understand that that, he's, and, and Bonson says, I'm not going to say that that's a bad thing to use reason, but understand that he's using that as his ultimate uh, starting point. So I thought that was... Uh, uh, effective. Um, I thought it was also uh, significant on page four, which would be the third paragraph, where uh, he talks about uh, empirical evidence. Bonson does as a presuppositionalist. He talks about the evidence of the created order, you know, design, the, the, the human body, the, the universe, the evidence of history, special revelation. Um, but he understands that, you know, one's uh, pre uh, presuppositions are going to determine where they go with those things, and so you need to have the right as opposed to the wrong. And then on page five, he gets into the transcendental proof of God's existence, which is that, you know, the, it's stated here in bold, I suggest we can prove the existence of God from the impossibility of the contrary. The transcendental proof for God's existence is that without him, it is impossible to prove anything. So that's significant because he's not, I think most of us are used to well, here, I'm going to prove God. Let's look at cause and effect. Let's look at design. Let's look at all these things first. And pretty much what Bonson does is say, okay, atheist, you know, you have a worldview that you're claiming is true. I'm going to show you that it, that it's, it, it breaks down. It's internally inconsistent. So uh, Christianity being true because of the impossibility of the contrary. Stein uh, goes and, uh, you know, he makes this claim that atheists aren't really saying they can prove there is no God. Um, I've done some reading on that. that. That doesn't appear to me from research I've done to be the normal explanation of atheism. So I, I, I think when Bonson was pressing him on that, I think that's what he was getting at, was what's your evidence and sources for that? And Stein, to his credit, had a couple sources, so Bonson had to drop it. But I, I don't think that's the norm with atheism. So uh, then you get into the theistic proofs on page 7. So he, what, he, what Stein does is just go through the laundry list he starts with cosmological argument. So, you know, he, pretty much he goes at the idea, uh, he, he puts everything must have a cause, therefore the universe must have a cause, and that cause was God. God was the first or uncaused, uncaused cause. This leads to a real logical bind for the theist, because if everything must have a cause, then God must have a cause. And if God had a cause, he cannot be the first or uncaused cause. I, he misrepresents the cosmological argument there, because... Uh, the cosmological argument is that every contingent thing needs a cause. Not necessarily everything needs a cause, but every contingent thing needs a cause. And so we would not consider God to be a contingent thing. He uh, has a seity. He exists in and of himself. So I don't even really think he's stated there. I think you could almost, and I know he's being brief, but I, don't, I think that's a little bit of a straw man argument. Plus, part of the argument from the cosmo part of the cosmological argument is that you can't have an infinite regress of causes that itself is an illog is is a logical impossibility you can't just have causes going back into infinity so if there if there ends up having to be a first domino then you know you you're going to come up with something that does, itself doesn't need a cause so i thought that was a little bit of a misrepresentation 
And I'd say the same thing with the teleological argument. I would say you can't have an infinite regress of designers. <laughs> there has to come a point where there is a, uh, a, a designer of which there, he was not designed himself. But his argument from life is kind of convoluted. Um, let's see. And then you get into the uh, cross-examination. I mean, clearly, uh, uh, Bonson got him on that whole issue of whether there can be um, anything that's immaterial that he would accept. And he referred to the, uh, bon or Stein asked him, can you give me an, any other example other than God that's immaterial? And Bonson answered the laws of logic. So he caught Bonson or Stein in a clear contradiction there. Okay, any thoughts on that first part? Good yeah. Question. Uh, Bonson was kind of commenting that uh, Stein was kind of pushing the bounds of the laws of the mm -hmm. of the debate for the cross examination. Yeah. What was the? What are you trying to do there? Or, or what, what's what are the rules for the cross examination? Are, there, are they not supposed to? Ask yeah. In other words, he. I think. I think in a nutshell. Bonson was telling Stein that he's getting off track. I guess Bonson sensed him wanting to talk about whether there's immaterial soul or whatever was getting off track of the of the key issue, whether there is a God or not. So I think I think he was that's what he was pushing back on. Yep. I think you're only supposed to ask questions based on the opening statement. Based on okay. Right. So specific so okay. He's good. Off, uh, okay. okay. So he's not good. Addressing yeah, you're right. Yeah. That's good. Um, Carlos pointed out that they were supposed to, the questions were supposed to be directly related to the, to the opening statement. So the parameters were such that Bonson pointed that out. Okay, let's, uh, all right, let's listen to some more of it. Dr. Bonson, I now turn to you for an eight minute rebuttal. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Stein is uh, not into this debate yet tonight. We are uh, debating the nature of, uh, I mean, the existence of God. I specified that I would be speaking in order to avoid logical contradiction of one particular view of God, the Christian view of God, which I personally hold. Dr. Stein says that he will not restrict himself to the Christian conception of God. Well, that's fine, he may not, but uh, all the time he uses on anything that's not the Christian conception of God will be irrelevant. In fact, I will join him in refuting those other conceptions of God. <laughs> The existence of God that I'm arguing tonight is the Christian one. Secondly, when Dr. Stein defines an atheist as one who finds the theistic proofs inadequate, that is unproven but not disproven, he's engaging in linguistic revision. He does quote for us, of course, to, um, a, or he said that he could and I trust that he can, uh, to atheists who likewise define atheism that way. But you see, that it strikes me as similar to a Christian who defines his position as being true at the outset, and therefore it must be true because it's true by definition. He has minimized the task that is before him by simply saying, I'm here to show that the theistic proofs are inadequate. Well, you see, even at that, though, he didn't do his job, even though that was less than what he really should be doing because he gave us 11 basic proofs for God, attributing one to me that I didn't use and do not use and did not assume. He mentioned 11 basic proofs, but did not deal with the one that I gave in my opening presentation. So he has not dealt yet with the argument that is before us this evening. Dr. Stein has mentioned logical binds and logical self-contradictions. He says that he holds that the laws of logic are universal, uh, but however, they are conventional in nature. Uh, that is not at all acceptable philosophically. If the laws of logic are conventional in nature, then you might have different societies that use different laws of logic. It might be appropriate in some society to say both, my car is in the parking lot, and it's not the case that my car is in the parking lot. That is, law, uh, certain societies that have a convention that says, go ahead and contradict yourself. Of course, there are, in a sense, subgroups within our own society that might think that way. Thieves have a tendency to say, this is not my wallet, but it's not the case that it's not my wallet. They might engage in contradictions like that, but I don't think any of us would want to accept that. The laws of logic are not conventional or not sociological. 
I would say the laws of logic have a transcendental necessity about them. They are universal, they are invariant, and they are not material in nature. And if they are not that, then I'd like to know in an atheist universe how it's possible to have laws in the first place, and secondly, how it's possible to justify those laws. The laws of logic, you see, are abstract. As abstract entities, which is the appropriate philosophical term, not spiritual entities, as Dr. Stein is speaking of, as abstract entities, that is to say, non-individual or universal in character, they are not materialistic. As universal, they are not experienced to be true. There may be experiences whereby the laws of logic are used, but what? no one has universal experience. No one has tried every possible uh, instance of a law of logic. As invariant, they don't fit into what uh, most materialists would tell us about the constantly changing nature of the world. And so you see, we have a real problem on our hands. Dr. Stein wants to use the laws of logic tonight. I maintain in so doing, he's borrowing my worldview. For you see, within the theistic worldview, laws of logic make sense. Within the theistic worldview, there can be abstract, universal, invariant entities, such as the laws of logic. Within the theistic worldview, you cannot contradict yourself, because to so do, you engage in the nature of lying, and that's contrary to the character of God as we perceive it. And so the laws of logic are something that Dr. Stein's going to have to explain as an atheist, or else relinquish using them. The transcendental argument for the existence of God, then, which Dr. Stein has yet to touch, and which I don't believe he can surmount, is that without the existence of God, it's impossible to prove anything. And that's because in the atheistic world, you cannot justify and cannot account for laws in general. Laws of thought in particular, laws of nature, cannot account for the human mind and the fact that it's more than electrochemical complexes and events and cannot give us moral absolutes. That is to say, in the atheist conception of the world, there's really no reason to debate. Because in the end, as Dr. Stein has said, all these laws are conventional. All these laws are not really law-like in their nature. They're just, well, if you're an atheist and a materialist, you'd have to say they're just something that happens inside the brain. But you see, what happens inside your brain is not the same as what happens inside my brain. And so what happens inside of your brain is not a law. It doesn't uh, necessarily correspond to what happens in mine. In fact, it can't be identical with what is inside of my mind or brain because we don't have the same brains. If the laws of logic come down to being materialistic entities, then they no longer have their law-like character. If they are only social conventions, then, of course, what we might do tonight to win the debate is just define a new set of laws, and we'll say all those who want the convention that says atheism must be true, or theism must be true, and we have the following laws which we conventionally adopt to prove it, you see, we'll be satisfied. But no one is satisfied. That's not a rational procedure to follow. The laws of logic cannot be avoided. The laws of logic cannot be accounted for in the materialistic universe. Therefore, the laws of logic are one of many evidences that without God, you can't prove anything at all. Thank you, Dr. Monson. Dr. Stein, your eight-minute rebuttal, please. Okay, I'll now um, touch on transcendental evidence, the existence of God, which is, uh, I think, the only time I could really do such is in my rebuttal. <clears throat> but first, I'd like to, to do one more important thing. Rather than asking what is the cause of the universe, we must first ask, does the universe require a causal explanation? Rather than asking what is responsible for design in nature, we must ask, does nature exhibit design? God is given as a solution to a metaphysical problem, but no consideration is given to whether such a problem exists in the first place. But God is not an explanation for anything. For example, if you say, if I ask you, how did the universe come? And you say, God created it. That doesn't answer the question. The question is, how did God create it? And I defy any theist to explain how God created it. Basically, what you're saying is that an unknowable being is responsible for a given phenomenon which he caused through unknowable means. And that's not an explanation, but rather a concession that the phenomenon is totally inexplicable. Now, about the laws of science. An atheist world, first of all, I don't think that Dr. Bonson understands what a scientific law is. 
A scientific law is an observation that's made over and over and over again. The law of gravitation, we drop objects all over the world in different situations and we always observe that they fall to the earth. So eventually we make a statistical statement that objects are likely, almost 100% likely to fall to the earth if they're not accelerating in the opposite direction. Okay? In other words, a rocket doesn't fall to the earth immediately, but eventually will if it doesn't escape the gravity of the earth. So these scientific laws are merely consensuses based on thousands and hundreds of thousands of observations. The laws of logic are also consensuses based on observations. The fact that they can predict something correctly shows us that we're on the right track, that we're corresponding to reality in some way. If I can plug in a formula and show exactly where a cannonball is going to land and predict exactly where it will strike, then my mathematics is reflecting something valid about the behavior of cannonballs that are fired on this earth. Otherwise, I wouldn't have, have picked the exact spot. And mathematics is basically logic, again, used in the same way by consensus of tested things that are self-verifying. I'm not explaining it as well as I could, but that's basically what I'm saying. And an atheist universe then goes on the basis of the fact that matter has certain intrinsic behavior patterns. Electrons repel each other because they're both negatively charged. Protons repel each other. An electron and a proton attract each other. The opposite poles of the magnet do that. That's an inherent property of, a, of matter. That is what produces the regularity in the universe. If there were no regularity, then there would be no science possible because you couldn't predict anything. Matter wouldn't behave the same the second time as it did the first time or the third or the fourth. So the, the, the lack of having a god is in no way detrimental to logic and to having laws in an atheist universe. In fact, if we had a god, we could very easily have an irrational god who did things capriciously so that if, if, a, 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 if I threw a ball, one, one time I threw it, it would go up and the next time down and you know crash straight down and soar right up. That would be just as much evidence for a god as a regularly behaving ball or object drop. I mean, we could have a god who, who makes the rules and changes them from time to time, or we could have one that makes things the same, or we could have a universe that just behaves that way normally. Now, um, to ask what caused the universe, although we didn't get into this exact thing, I'm trying to show you that it's to ask an absurd question in the first place, to give God as the answer. First of all, I mentioned it doesn't explain anything, but secondly, before something can act as a cause, it must first exist. That is, it must be a part of the universe. And the universe sets the foundation for a causal explanation, but it can not itself require a causal explanation. I don't know if that's clear. If I say, every human being had a mother, that's, that's a valid question. But I, if I ask, who was the mother of the human race? That is a non-valid question because the human race didn't have a mother. I can ask what was the cause of this planet exploding, but to ask what was the cause of the universe is to ask an invalid question. And to offer the answer as God is to offer an invalid answer to an invalid question. We haven't gotten into morality. I think I'm going to leave that for the second half. If Dr. Bonson doesn't raise it, I will. He makes an awful lot of statements that are basically feelings. He felt God entered his life. He felt that this happened. He felt that Jesus was resurrected. Uh, if, he, if, he, if he were held to the historian's standard, especially the standard required when a miracle is done, as David Hume said, when a miraculous or very unlikely event, such as the resurrection, although Hume didn't use that exact analogy, that exact example, occurs, we must demand an extraordinary amount of proof if I say that the sun is going to rise tomorrow, we don't need too much proof because it's been rising every day. If I say the sun is not going to rise tomorrow, then we need an extraordinary amount of evidence before someone will take that seriously because it's an unusual event. Okay? Now, he has not held up the historian's standard to a lot of the things he's accepting from the Bible as evidence for God. And I think that if he did so, he would soon see that those evidences dried up. Now, to get to transcendental evidence, finally, The statement that if God did not exist, we couldn't prove anything, 
and that logic and, and, and uh, scientific laws would be invalid is absolute nonsense, and I think I've demonstrated part of that. He says that laws of logic are the same everywhere. This is not true, although they are mostly the same. And I wonder if he's ever heard of a Zen cone. And the answer to a Zen cone is something which, like, you know, what is the sound of one hand clapping is the most famous Zen cone. The answer to that kind of a question is, is, is in a different type of logic, in a sense, or it's extra logical, if you want to call it that. But I do think that most logic as we accept it in, in, the, in the Western world and most of the Eastern world is basis of agreement on people that reflect something about the universe. The idea that, that transcendental evidence for the existence of God is that the, the impossibility of the opposite, that the world view would not be rational if it were atheistic, is total nonsense. And I've demonstrated to you that it depends on the inherent properties of matter. If matter has the properties where it behaves regularly, then we have order in the universe, and we have a logical, rational universe without a God. The God issue is not germane if matter behaves in a regular way. And, and I would hold that the properties of matter, as demonstrated over and over again, are regular. And it's an inherent property of matter. So I think that the transcendental evidence statement can be dismissed as mere wishful thinking coupled with misinformation about what scientific laws are and what atheists would hold. In fact, most scientists, in fact, science itself is atheistic. Science is not allowed to use a supernatural explanation for anything. And there's a very good reason for that. If, if your experiment came out one way, you could say God did it. If it came out the opposite way, you could say God did that. You would never make any progress in explaining anything in science. And so the agreed upon consensus for rules of science is that naturalistic explanations only are asked for and allowed. Okay, we have concluded segment number one of this evening's debate. We will now enter segment number two of this evening's debate. Dr. Stein will open segment number two with a 10-minute opening statement. All right. So what are your thoughts so far on the first half of the debate here? What do you think of uh, Stein? Stuck to his notes? <laughs> okay. Anybody else? Jared. Uh, he never seems to really get at um, Bodson's, you know, argument that basically shoots the whole, you know, shoots the legs out from under mm -hmm. everything Stein's trying to argue for. He kind of tried to touch on it at the end, but boy, that was a pretty piecemeal. Like nothing was just not making yeah. sense. So right. he's, he's not he's not addressing the issue that Bodson right. brought up, namely, you know, the laws of logic. And, you know, um, right. And, uh, he's, he's very convinced on his own arguments. But yet, he's not answering the questions. It's kind of, you know, yes, he's sticking to his notes and, you know, thinks that he's answered everything, but I, I feel like he hasn't answered anything. Mm -hmm. It seems to me, it, my impression of it is that he's used to dealing with Christians from a different perspective. So he comes in all studied up <laughs> for the normal way, and then Bonson hits him from this other side, which is more foundational and more directly challenging to his own world view. And I think he's just, this, this is a, I think he's swimming. I think he's been hit in a way that he wasn't expecting, and this is just a long two hours <laughs> for him. Because it is, I mean, he's struggling, because in other words, he's expecting this other line of argumentation, and, and then so he's, because his answers seem like almost, uh, at, at, at times, he's obviously extremely intelligent, relatively, but, uh, on, on certain things, but he's, uh, some of it seems convoluted and, and thrown off, yeah. I'm just amazed at how well, I mean, he basically plays right into Bonson's <laughs> argument that, that, that there are, you know, universal absolutes and laws, and right. I mean, he, he's, uh, yeah, it's just amazing. <laughs> right. Yeah, he did. When he, on that early in the debate, when Bonson got him on that laws of logic, things that are immaterial, other than God, and he said laws of logic, that was a <laughs> slam dunk well, moment. The closing statement where, yeah. where he says, you know, he, he tries to deny that, that, you know, there are universal principles or laws that are passed down from above, mm -hmm. but then he basically goes back and says, well, we just found them from below, you know, using statistics and certainty, and then right. goes back and still uses them, right. and, and, you know, just tries to think that because he in his, in his sinful pride found them himself, that, that that disproves God. Right. Good. All right, let's go way back here, and then we'll work our way back this way. Go ahead. There was a point in the debate where he was trying to discount the need to even argue certain points. 
Uh, Stein? Yeah. Okay. One in particular was, uh, you know, we, we, we need to find some uh, source for intelligent design. Well, wait a, wait a second. You know, we don't, we don't even believe that there is a question of intelligent design. And I think of someone of his, of his intelligence to say something like that was incredibly dishonest. Mm. You know, because mm. he knows so much about the ovarian, you know, whales. Japanese whales and all that, right? <laughs> to say that there's no evidence of design, that's outrageous. Yeah, mm. it is outrageous. It's, and it's irrational. Mm. Let's see. Uh, let's go to John, then Nathan will work this way. Well, he just engaged in a huge amount of misrepresentation. He misrepresented the definition of faith. You know, faith is believing something to be so because we want it to be so. <laughs> so he told he even misrepresented what science is. His argument from science saying that matter is, uh, but the stable properties of matter are inherent. Well, that violates the second law of thermodynamics. So you know, to, to, he's violating his own scientific laws that he's saying he holds to. So right. It's a huge amount of contradiction and misrepresentation. Good. Let's go to Nathan and then Terrence. I just thought he definitely wasn't prepared. Maybe you wonder if there's anything, for instance, something after this that someone actually argued with Bonson that was prepared, and what that would be like. Yeah, it uh, definitely like if you go on atheist websites and stuff like that, they, they try to flip it and use the transcendental argument as reason for atheism and that kind of stuff now. But I, but yeah, or early on, I, I when he he does he does. Uh, debate another individual, I think Tabash, and I, I don't think Tabash really got it yet either. But um, but yeah, supposedly they've offered reasons or whatever. But I haven't seen anything very good on that. Let's see, Terrence. Yeah, that was, was going to be my question. Mm -hmm. Since this happened like 23 years ago, have they are they still stuck, or do they come up with arguments <laughs> that people would? Think that at least makes sense because yeah. now he's spinning. But I was just wondering. <laughs> the answer is yes. They they've this was so effective. I think they they've offered responses. Maybe we could even look at that sometime. Maybe I'll get on the internet or whatever. Because if you go on there, they'll offer response. I can't remember specifically what the responses are, but they have. Yep. Uh, to give Stein his due, I I think if Bonson had engaged him on the traditional argument. I think Stein is quite well prepared and does mm -hmm. present some very, you know, in a debate format, would be difficult to answer many of the good right. points that he makes. Mm -hmm. I just think he's completely unprepared for what Bonson brings to the table. Right. But in a traditional debate, going down through his 11, mm -hmm. you know, traditional proofs for God, I, I think it'd be an interesting debate. I, mm -hmm. you know, I think Stein's very well prepared and, and yeah, does absolutely. present his case and ask some very difficult questions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he does. Like I said, I think the way he did the cosmological and tele, particularly the cosmological, I don't think he did a very good job on that. But yeah, just at face value. But that's what's good about what, what Bonson's doing here is he's, he's, he's getting at the more foundational issues. That's come like Van Til says that the, the presuppositional approach as compared to the evidentialist approach is more going at the unbeliever with uh, atomic bombs and fire throwers. In the sense it's getting... <laughs> at the root of things. And, uh, you know, presuppositionalists have often pointed out, too, that if you're not dealing with the root issues with the unbeliever, you may put out one fire and he starts two more type of thing, and so it never ends. It's like you give a sufficient answer to one thing, well, what about this and this, and so it just keeps going and going. So, yeah, Tim. Um, I think, like, like, because he wasn't prepared, what he's trying to do right now is he's trying to make Bonson into the person who's like putting that he wants to debate, so he's like putting words in his mouth. <laughs> like like he said he said he felt the resurrection and he yeah. felt this and he hasn't talked he about that at all. That, yeah. You know, and but normally I guess the Christians he would talk to are gonna be arguing from experience. Right. And so he's trying to make Bonson out to be something he's not right now. So Yeah, so that's a good that. point. That is. Yeah. yeah. Just, just to I guess in that last part, was he Kind of his main argument against the transcendental argument was that his definition of logic is the observation of matter. Was that like his what he was trying to? Stein's uh, definition of logic. Yeah, like he. I remember in the last part of his rebuttal, he was like, "Okay, now to the transcendental." Yeah. And then he just started talking about like how matter, like the 
observation of matter, that's where he, that's how he defines order and logic. Mm -hmm. So I guess is that, would you say that that's his main argument for the transcendental argument? Or yeah, in other words, in trying to refute it. Right, like that's the authority of what he defines yeah. logic as. And, and yeah, on page 18, uh, three paragraphs from the bottom. Now to get to the transcendental evidence, finally. The statement that if God did not exist, we couldn't prove anything, and that logic and scientific laws would be invalid is nonsense, and I think I've demonstrated part of that. I would say no. <laughs> you know, you may think you're going to, but you haven't so far. I, I think what he goes, at least on this particular section, he tries to argue that laws of logic um, aren't the same everywhere, which is kind of an interesting thing. <laughs> he says the laws of logic are the same everywhere. This is not true, and then he refers to the Zen cone with the sound of one hand clapping. I think Bonson deals with that a little bit later. Um, and then he says, but I think that most logic that we accept in the West and most of the Eastern world is the, is the basis of agreement on people that reflects something about the universe. The idea that the transcendental evidence of the existence of God is the impossibility of the opposite, that the world view would not be rational if it were atheistic is total nonsense. And I've demonstrated to you that it depends on the inherent properties of matter. If matter has properties that it behaves then we have order in the universe, and we have a logical, rational universe without God, which is the very thing that Bonson's going to challenge him on there. Uh, the God issue is not germane if matter behaves in a regular way. And I would hold that properties and matter as demonstrated over and over again are regular. So, I mean, Bonson, yeah, so it does, that is what he's arguing there. But again, Bonson's going to ask him, how can you get order or regular, you know, in a time plus chance uh, universe. So, yeah, he's going to argue. And then he argues for a closed system. I mean, pretty much what it ends up being is you can't, uh, you know, he argues on page 18, I think the third and fourth paragraphs from the top. I can ask, what was the cause of this planet exploding? But to ask what was the cause of the universe is to ask an invalid question. I would just say that's a naturalistic assumption of a closed system universe, which we wouldn't grant. Uh, I thought, I thought it was quite ironic when he re referred to David Hume. I mean, of course, David Hume's an empiricist and really even more of a skeptic. So, I mean, H Hume wrote the classic work, uh, you know, Against Miracles. And, but, but Hume, again, assumes a, a naturalistic closed system universe. But, th but then the example he gives, um, uh, you know, he's just talking about Hume. And then he says, if I say the sun is going to rise tomorrow, you don't need much proof of it because... It's been rising every day. If I say the sun is not going to rise tomorrow, then we need an extraordinary amount of evidence because it's an extraordinary event. I mean, it's kind of interesting. I mean, Hume is the one who argued that against that you could know things for certain based on cause and effect, and he actually used <laughs> the concept you can't know for sure that the sun's going to rise tomorrow based on past experience. You can't make that causal connection. So I just thought it was ironic that he'd use Hume for evidence for that and then t use the sun rising example of which Hume wouldn't have, wouldn't have agreed with, so. <clears throat> I, I thought it was kind of interesting when he gets in the, he starts giving the criteria on page 17 about the question, this would be the first full paragraph, God is given as a solution to a metaphysical problem, but no consideration is given to whether such a problem exists in the first place. But God is not an explanation for anything. For example, if you say, if I ask you, how did the universe come into, into existence and you say God created it, that doesn't answer the question. The question is, how did God create it? I mean, that's quite a standard there. And I defy any theist to define how God created it. So, well, I mean, that, that's quite a standard there. Not just that something created something, but actually how he did it. I thought that was quite a uh, thing to state. Okay, any other thoughts? Well, how about, uh, what did you think of Bonson overall? Richard. I had a question about what you just said. Wouldn't it be a logical explanation to, he, he thinks that he knows how God created the universe, right? I mean, or how the universe came into being. You mean Bonstein? Yeah. How the universe? He's confident in his own assertions about how God created the universe. You're talking about, I mean, Stein's the atheist. Right. The atheist. So how God would have created? Would well, he, I mean, the, the scientific person thinks that he knows how God created knows. the universe. So, by, you know, by evolution. Okay. Now he, was, he would use the term God, I mean, Stein. But in other words, there. He but he has an explanation for the creation of the universe. Yeah, through Big Bang or whatever, trusted. right? What's I mean? Now the Christian could say, you know, God spoke the universe into existence. He doesn't mm -hmm. have to do all that because he's God. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah so that'd be good. It would be good to push him on Woody, because because ultimately he's going to come down to some sort of Big Bang approach or something in which he could be pressed on. Good. So what do you think of, of uh, Bonson? Yeah. yeah. He's dealing here, uh, staying back to that question, he's dealing with the secondary issues. Mm -hmm. How could, not uh, for the cause, why? Why did he create it? So he's dealing with the details, which is science dealing with, mm -hmm. how things mm -hmm. are working and find out the laws. Mm -hmm. But he's dismissing the, the more basic question the why in the first place. That was quite right. The responses would push pushing right. Secondary as opposed to primary. Yep. Let's go back here and then up here. Okay, Bonson's a good communicator. Yes. Yeah, so he's understandable, he's quick. You know, his answers are very precise. And so Stein has at times wanders and, and even at times will say, I guess that wasn't very clear. <laughs> but um, yeah, Bonson's very, uh, very to the point. Yeah. I find it to be enormously disciplined. Um, you know, I, you look at Stein's attacks and it's very tempting to, to wander off and answer them, right. but he doesn't. Mm -hmm. He's got his thing and he's going with this. He's yeah. going with this presuppositional and, you know, I mean, he answers as much as he needs to and gets right back to yeah. his point, he which is, rabbit trail, yeah. is fantastic, but very difficult to do in a debate format. You're, you know, mm -hmm. you're tempted to kind of, well, I've got to answer this guy. Right. And, but he doesn't. And right. He just, he just keeps going. That's a good point. Yep. It really seems like that Bonson is the one who's setting the tone for the debate. Mm -hmm. Like, uh, he's got <coughs> Stein to really respond to him, but he doesn't. He just kind of almost dismisses mm -hmm. uh, what Stein offers as a as rebuttal to him. Yeah. So he's he really does control the debate because yeah. even so, if you even notice sometimes, even in cross examination, Stein will ask a question and then Bonson will a answer his question with the question and then Stein will answer that. <laughs> Whereas other words, yeah. you know, some guy might say, "Hey, wait, I'm asking the questions here or something." But <laughs> so he, yeah. Say his, he doesn't put anything out there that he doesn't want, and the things that Bonson puts out, he wants him to ask because it's going to further right. extend his argument. So he's yes. very wise and, and not saying too much, right. but only giving what is going to favor him in the debate. Right, he's not showing all of his cards right away, and he's staying focused and on track, and so it doesn't rabbit trail. Like a boxer, man. He's, yeah. He knows exactly what's going on. Yes. He's not swinging and wasting punches anywhere else. He's right. not exactly. Right, no knows. wasted punches. That's yeah. all stated. Yep. It almost seems like Bonson, I mean, he's, it's obvious that he's done his homework when it comes to Stein. And it makes me wonder if, if Stein has even knows anything about what Bonson thinks or if, if he has read anything about from <coughs> Bonson or if anything was in print before. Because it's, like, it's almost like he doesn't, he has no clue. It seems like at this point in 1980 that he was pretty blindsided. Yeah, because he... He admits later that... He admits later. As a matter of fact, I can't remember if it's on the... Uh, you don't need to rush to it or anything right now, but on the on I actually looked up on you know in 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 Wikipedia, just I went and just looked up because he's on Stein. I mean he's passed away now. I can't remember if it's on Wikipedia or some other source or whatever. But he but he had he admitted toward the end of his life that he, he that that threw him, that he just yeah just in other words he wasn't real happy with how that how that went yeah. But was. Was, I mean, were, were these things that Bonson had talked about, were, were they published in, in order that... I would say you know? yes and no. Yes in the sense that he's, he's playing out in a practical way Van Tillian presuppositional apologetics. So I guess I want to be careful because I think I, I, if that would be a good interesting thing to go look at the whole issue of, of the, of the history, how much, how much he could have known about Bonson if he really would have wanted to do it. seems like... It, this was the thing that really launched Bonson as far, and I think even though he died in 1995, I think most of his writings came after 85. I'll have to look into that a little bit, but that's my impression. So, uh, but it seems to me, I, I mean, Bonson is definitely, we haven't read Van Til yet, but he's very Van Tillian. As a matter of fact, frames a little more, I mean, Van Til ends up being the pioneer for presuppositionalism, and, you know, so of the last 20 years or so, I mean, you've had, or 30 years, you've had Bonson and Frame really be the main kind of the the uh, tor uh, the, the torchbearers or whatever the carriers for uh, Van Tilly and presuppositionalism. I'd say uh, Frame 
is probably, I don't want to say drift away. I would say, let me put it this way, Bonson would be more closely aligned down the line with Van Til, more so than Frame. Uh, but so yeah, so I, I think what you have is here, I, I think you have, Bonson I think is showing, at least in this sort of format, what Van Tillian presuppositionalism is supposed to look like. Because I think Van Til's more theoretical, harder to understand, not very practical, and then Bonson comes along and shows how it actually would look in an encounter. So I don't think, I don't think that uh, Stein had probably had much to go on. <laughs> yeah. So if this is a you know, representation of Van Til, you know, understand why atheists didn't kind of overlook Van Til in you know, this position. Why did they overlook yeah. him? Or? For, for so long, yeah. they haven't been able to come Because up nobody understands Van Til. No. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Um, yeah, I mean, I mean, because Van, I mean, Van Til ends up. I mean, he's, I mean, he's a, uh, you know, pretty much, you know, a, a Christian evangelical-like person who probably, you know, doesn't get much respect in the, you know, in the normal naturalistic atheistic community. And then you have Bonson who actually comes and engages that. He purposely goes and gets his PhD in philosophy from USC, and sets himself up in a position to be considered somebody who can go on campus and debate and all that kind of stuff. So he. Yes, yeah, so I would say that their understanding of Van Til would have been probably slim and none, <laughs> you know, before, before Bonson. And when you get in, when we talk about the frame book, frame will have some differences with, but frame will be a little bit more on the problem you know, that more favorable towards cosmological and teleological and those kinds of things. And so there'll be some differences. Yeah. Well, since we're acknowledging that every atheist starts off in an intellectual dishonest position mm -hmm. because God's already made it plain to him. He's already crossed certain hurdles to to deceive himself. Now, obviously, you can't you can't argue from that perspective. They're not going to listen to that. I, I'm still kind of outside the whole issue of apologetics. Honestly, going what's the value redemptively? Um, I keep while well, I'm thinking through the debate and all the issues that are being discussed, and I recognize well, Stein already started from a position of dishonesty. Mm -hmm. We're going to try to convince him with rational arguments why his positions need to be deconstructed they don't make any logical sense and he's not even re responding like we've said to yeah. clear fallacies in his own thinking um i'm just trying to see its value i would say i think bonson would see this as part of the package of the gospel because when you get to the end he pretty much shares the gospel i mean he sees that he doesn't so bonson's not separating this from the gospel or from any part of christianity um you know, I mean, we're going to talk about, uh, you know, the, the statements in Scripture where, where it gets into the whole issue of, uh, you know, uh, answering a fool according to his folly, showing the foolishness of unbelief. I, I think Bonson would see what he's doing as part of this package of presenting Christian truth in the gospel is showing the, the foolishness, you know, of his worldview, hoping that God uses that. I mean, because I mean, Bonson's going to admit as a Calvinist that it's only going to be the Spirit of God working in his heart. But, but so Bonson's not really separating what he's doing from preaching and evangelism. He's seeing this as part of, part of the package and, and thus sees showing the unbeliever the foolishness of his view to be legitimate within the context of, of, of the Christian message. So, that's, so he, I think he would agree that he wouldn't separate. He's not, I don't think Bonson would just say, I'm just trying to show rationally how this guy is being inconsistent, and I hope he sees it. I don't. I don't think he would word it like that. Right. I, I understand. I think Frame made the same yeah. arguments yeah. at the beginning of his book. I, I don't equate it with preaching personally, but I, I do see where that perspective is coming from. Mm -hmm. But it looks like pre-evangelism to me, which yeah. I'm still looking for the biblical paradigm for that being longer than a couple minutes and then repent. Mm -hmm. uh, so I mean, as a skeptic, kind of the apologetic field, okay. still. <laughs> I'm still looking for the biblical paradigms along the way to, to demonstrate that it, it has merit redemptively like the gospel message to over, like the Spirit uses that, I know, yeah. to overcome the objections of the faith. But other rational arguments, I'm still looking for how the Spirit wants to use that like the gospel message. Like a debate like this is a great illustration. Mm -hmm. the study doesn't convert. He never converts. I mean, that's not necessarily a good example, because some people do probably, yeah. but outside of the gospel, 
the apologetic argument as having that same spiritual effect of converting. And no one's saying it does, so I'm still waiting for its value. Does okay. that make sense? Hopefully okay. it's established. Okay, and we'll, uh, we'll uh, I think when we get into the, the uh, always ready by Bonson stuff, I think we'll get more into that, as, particularly as he, he believes that there's some uh, statements from Proverbs and stuff that help support that kind of approach.